The topic for today is history taking in stress urinary incontinence. As I always say, the first thing we have to understand about stress urinary incontinence is that here the symptom itself is the diagnosis. And what does it mean? Let me explain. So, according to the ICS definition, SUI is a complaint of involuntary leak of urine in those activities where intra-abdominal pressure is increased. So, if the patient tells you that she leaks urine by laughing, coughing or sneezing, that's it. The diagnosis is locked and sealed then and there. The first line of management for SUI that is pelvic floor muscle training can be initiated safely for her. However, a meticulous history is still required for a holistic and tailored treatment of each and every patient. History can be divided into these 10 headings in stress urinary incontinence. We shall discuss them one by one. First in history taking is introduction. Five things are important here. Age, less than 50 or more than 50. Remember, in urogynecology, 50 is the threshold and less than 50 is considered young. Menopause attained or not. More importantly, since how long the lady is in this estrogen deficient state. Parity plays a crucial role, you know, but more important maybe is the mode of delivery, whether it was vaginal, instrumental or cesarean. While occupations related to lifting heavy loads are important as a cause, equally important is to know those who are involved in sports, athletic activities, sophisticated job profiles or professions with long working hours for the sake of impact on their quality of life. In chief complaints, I will repeat again, the diagnosis of SUI is made as soon as the patient complains of it. But we have to ask which particular activity or activities cause this problem in her. This helps us to decide the severity. The other important component is duration of symptoms. Cause the important reason of transient SUI is cystitis. And in case of SUI, to miss cystitis is as big a blunder as missing pregnancy in secondary amenorrhea. Specific questions that we need to ask in history of present illness. Number one is whether she has urgency also at times, which will make it a case of mixed urinary incontinence and the management will change now. If SUI is associated with burning maturation, suprapubic pain, plus or minus fever, diagnosis goes more in favor of cystitis. Associated mass per vaginum opens a Pandora's box where we have to ask all the components of pelvic floor disorders as the surgical management will go totally wrong if we ignore this. Though we do not have a universally accepted severity tool to assess how severe the problem is, but association with activities helps us to do this. For example, a lady who leaks only while jogging or jumping has less severe disease as compared to the one who leaks even with the change of posture. In these cases, natural course of progression of disease over the years makes the history more reliable. Last but not the least, asking the impact on quality of life helps us to judge how motivated the patient is to seek treatment. In past history, we ask for similar complaints in the past. 
and if any treatment like pelvic floor muscle training or pessary was tried. In this context, it's very important to understand the natural history of SUI in a case of prolapse. In the initial stages, because of generalized pelvic floor weakness, patient with prolapse usually complains of SUI also. Then there comes a stage with progression of this prolapse that the bladder neck gets kinked. That's the stage where the symptom of SUI vanishes. If in this stage the bladder or the cystocele is lifted up by a pessary or reconstructive surgery, the patient will start complaining of incontinence of urine again. This is what is called as de novo stress incontinence. Medical problems like diabetes can have recurrent cystitis leading to episodes of SUI. Very important is to have a good control of blood sugars in these women if the management plan is surgery. Placement of TVT mesh, which is a foreign body, can create havoc in the form of mesh erosions, infections and discharge if the control of sugar is neglected. COPD or asthma can cause weakening of pelvic floor by repeatedly creating increased pressure in the abdominal pelvic cavity. It's important to take care of chronic lung issues that result in coughing and increased intra-abdominal pressure in post-op period too to have sustained results. Musculoskeletal and neurodegenerative pathologies can be the causative or aggravating factors. These are also important to plan the management for example, a patient with arthritis or early Parkinsonism would not be a good candidate to offer pelvic floor muscle training. History of hysterectomy and its relation with onset of SCY should be asked for. Reconstructive prolapse surgery, as has been discussed earlier, might cause de novo stress incontinence. Previous failed incontinence procedures will help to guide management plan. A patient with history of surgeries for hernia should be explained the chance of recurrence with conservative management or native tissue surgeries because of the probability of inherent connective tissue weakness. The role of parity and mode of delivery we have discussed. Sometimes I get patients who say that all their deliveries were by cesarean. Important question here is to ask that whether the cesarean was done electively before the onset of labor or was it a second stage section. That explains the pelvic floor trauma has already occurred before the patient was taken up for a cesarean delivery. We must not miss other gynec pathologies like a posterior wall fibroid that can cause bladder neck impingement against the pubic bone by acutely retroporting the uterus that leads to residual urine, recurrent infections and SUI. LMP must be asked before planning a date for surgery. It's a good practice to plan surgery after menses as pelvic tissues are quite congested premenstrually and that can lead to a lot of bleeding during surgery. I have seen women who have no risk factor for stress incontinence. Then when we delve into their personal life more, there is this association of the new era craze of gymming, especially lifting weights without supporting the pelvic floor this should be a big no to all of us. Sudden weight gain and loss both can cause stress urinary incontinence and both have potential to impact the treatment negatively. Excess intake of bladder irritants like tea, coffee, alcohol should be documented. Better will be to offer your patient to fill a 3-day bladder diary. 
Don't forget to ask what all medication she is on. The common medications that are notorious of causing SUI are diuretics, oral estrogen, antipsychotics, and antihypertensives. Sometimes only a change of class of medication is what is required to cure a patient with stress incontinence. Take home message here is that SUI is a unique disease where symptom is the diagnosis. But still, we need a meticulous history to confirm the diagnosis, rule out other types of incontinence, find out the cause, if any, modify the modifiable risk factors, and plan the most optimal management for our patient. Thank you.